this week as we continue in the third week of the Easter season and still are reading some of the Easter accounts, we're going back from John's Gospel, where we were last week, to Luke's Gospel, to Luke 24, starting at verse 36. This picks up uh, just after the Emmaus Road story, when the two disciples have come back and told the rest of the disciples about their amazing experience. So Luke 24, starting verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why did doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And the lectionary ends there at verse 48, but the, the last verse of the section really is verse 49 that comes next. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Now, if, if you ask several witnesses to give their accounts of the same incident... Their stories will have common themes, but the details will differ. Does this matter? Does it show them to be lying? Well, not necessarily at all. The different accounts will be because different elements were important to different ones of the witnesses, because they also remembered different parts, or their concerns and their interpretations varied, and, and so on. Some may summarise part of the event, others may spell things out in more word-for-word -word detail. And those who criticise the accounts of the resurrection in the four Gospels for being so vastly different need to remember basic elements of human nature like this. And our story this week seems rather like it must be Luke's account of at least the first thing we read last week in John 20 where Jesus appeared in the locked room to the disciples. So in Luke's account what does Jesus want us to learn about the resurrection? Two things. Firstly, Jesus wants his disciples to understand the physical nature of the resurrection. Look at those two proofs he gives them. Firstly, Jesus invites the disciples to touch his hands and feet to prove that he has flesh and bones, unlike a ghost, which is what they, they fear they, that they had seen. And in other words, Jesus isn't an ethereal being. He isn't a spirit who has found no place to rest in death, one of the popular beliefs about what the phenomenon of ghosts might be. Nor is he a cadaver brought back to life, nor is he a zombie. This is no episode of The Walking Dead. This is no horror movie. There is no need to fear. Jesus has been resurrected to material, 
physical life. Sure, it is very different in some ways, but it is physical. And this is underlined by the second proof Jesus gives when the disciples are still too emotional to believe. He asks for food and promptly devours some fish. And as the only fish and seafood eater in my family, more or less, I say I, I approve of that enthusiastically. When Jesus eats the fish, he isn't just showing that he has a physical body, he is also emphasising that he is not simply an immortal soul freed from bodily existence. And that's important because often that's kind of the, the, the view of life after death that we default to. We say things like the body isn't, an, isn't important, it's just a, a shell for the real person. But that's what some of the Greek philosophers taught. It's not what the New Testament teaches. And actually, if you do just believe in the immortal soul, and that the body is just a shell, it's a pretty disastrous belief to adopt. Why? Because if the body doesn't matter, then it certainly doesn't matter if we abuse it. Nor does it matter if we abuse someone else's body, despite the physical and emotional pain we cause. And if the body doesn't matter, it's probably a sign that physical and material things generally don't matter. Therefore, we just believe in a spiritual heaven. We don't need to worry about damage to the world because like the dreadful old hymn said, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. And that is not biblical. So we need to turn this round and to be positive. Jesus' physical resurrection is a sign that God cares about the physical and the material. Remember that in the creation and story of Genesis chapter 1, God looked at each stage of creation and pronounced it either good or even very good. God's attitude to his material creation hasn't changed. The resurrection spells out that he intends to redeem it. Remember how Revelation chapter 21 speaks of a new heaven and a new earth and of God making all things new. Well, the resurrection is the beginning of that process. The resurrection is therefore why we care about things like healing. The resurrection is why we care about justice. The resurrection is why, as Christians, we care about climate change and creation care. Take away the resurrection and none of these things matters. But they do matter because God is about making all things new, including the material world, and the physical resurrection of Jesus is his supreme sign to the world that these things matter. So, think of Jesus eating the fish next time you have fish and chips. Our Catholic friends eat fish on a Friday to avoid eating meat um, on, on Good Friday when we commemorate the death of Christ. But I suggest to you, it's every bit as valid to eat your fish and chips on a Sunday when we celebrate the resurrection, because it reminds us of Jesus' resurrection and all that rides on it. And therefore, don't just think about the physical nature of the resurrection. Don't just stop at the thinking. Go into the world and bring healing to people, to relationships and to the creation itself. Don't let the truth of Jesus' physical resurrection stay merely residing in your brain. Let that truth travel to your hands and feet and make a resurrection difference in the world. So that's the first thing that Jesus wants his disciples to learn about the importance of the physical nature of the resurrection. Secondly, Jesus wants his 
disciples to understand the place of the resurrection in the purposes of God. Now, proof and evidence like Jesus gives with saying, touch my hands and feet or give me some fish to eat, proof and evidence are important, but you know they only take us so far. They are the preparing of the ground for commitment. We can provide solid evidence for the Christian faith, but on its own, it doesn't bring anybody to Christ. It prepares someone's heart and mind for the challenge of commitment. And that's what's happened, if you like, so far in the story, with the proofs Jesus has given to the disciples. It's often what happens in discussions over a period of time with people today. To make the jump from understanding to being committed, we need Jesus to send the Holy Spirit to interpret the purposes of God to us. We need that spiritual element. And that's what Jesus does effectively here when he opens their minds so they could understand the scriptures. It takes a divine unveiling to appreciate the purposes of God and then be ready to throw our lot in with Jesus. And so now that's what Jesus does. He reveals the place of the resurrection in the divine purposes. He says it was always God's plan that the Messiah would suffer, die and be raised and that this would lead to the preaching of repentance throughout the world. But that's rather puzzling. Because taken on their own, the scriptures in question, which are pretty much the Old Testament as we know it, don't make any such claims in a particularly obvious way. You can only start to see it in the light of the resurrection. Then you begin to understand what God was up to in the prophecies about his servant in Isaiah, or about the Son of Man approaching the Ancient of Days in Daniel, or the Psalms with their talk of the Lord and my Lord. Two Lords, hey? What? How come this other Lord will sit at the right hand of the Lord? You wouldn't have guessed the ultimate meaning of all that without the resurrection. But now the penny drops and Jesus tells his disciples, you are witnesses of these things. This comes back, really, to that favourite Tom Wright quote of mine, Jesus is alive and we've got a job to do. Why? The resurrection shows that God has vindicated Jesus. Those who called for his crucifixion are exposed as in the wrong, and we realise we are all in the wrong before him. We all need to hear the call to repentance, because in the resurrection, God says that Jesus is in the right and all the rest of us are in the wrong. So the resurrection is here to bring a couple of changes into our lives. It certainly begins, first of all, with this repentance as we renounce our selfish ways to follow Jesus. But then it goes on to changing us from being all inward-looking, which itself can be a form of sin when we're just self-centred, to being outward-looking. Because this leads to the same conclusion as when we thought about that first thing about the physical nature of the resurrection. You see, not only are we sent into the world with the message of the healing of all creation, we now realise with this preaching of repentance, because the resurrection shows that Jesus is in the right and we're in the wrong, that the healing message is also about healing the rift between people and God. Now, I'm not suggesting that this means we spend every minute of every day bludgeoning people with the gospel. 
many of us have been subjected to that and it doesn't feel like the gospel, does it? But what it does mean is that we have this outward-looking focus where, as disciples of the risen Lord, our passion is for the healing of creation, the healing of people, the healing of relationships, and the healing of the breach between people and God. We shall show that in our actions, and we shall show that in our priorities, and we shall speak when the time is right, and when the opportunities come, and when people ask us, why on earth do you live like that? Remember, God is making all things new, and he began that task when he raised Jesus from death. Amen. to pray that you may make all things new and that you may bring healing to creation. We pray for the healing that is needed in the damage done to our climate and for the parts we may play in changing our actions and in lobbying. We pray for healing where people are torn about, torn apart by violence and war, and remembering the innocents who so often suffer the most. And so we pray for governments and militaries and other influential groups that they may seek peace and justice and reconciliation. 
We pray for the healing of people as we remember those afflicted by physical and mental conditions. At this time, we remember those still suffering from the coronavirus. We remember those who have suffered from mental ill health during the pandemic. And we pray for healing in our land and throughout the world. We pray for healing between people who have been torn apart by a rift between them, where forgiveness is needed, where apologies and repentance will help to bring that reconciliation. And we pray for the healing of the breach between people and God, for people to find that you are speaking to them and drawing them into your love, for those who need to find their way back to you. All these things we bring to you, Lord, that you may exercise your ministry of healing in many ways and that you will fulfill your purposes to make all things new. We pray in the name of our risen Lord, Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Yeah. 
Let's close with a blessing. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit remain with you now and always. Amen.